Well, my name is Stephanie Jarvis. I am a mycologist. I am a recipient of many uh, SOMA grants and awards through my scholastic achievements at San, San Francisco State with Dr. Dennis Desjardins and Brian Perry, who's in the next room doing microscopy. And um, also I worked with Dr. Kelson at Sonoma State, who's a founding member of the Sonoma Mycological Society. And with Dr. Kelson in my undergrad years, I worked on sudden oak death as a plant pathologist. And then I moved on to San Francisco State to work with uh, Dennis Desjardins, and he works with basidiomycetes. And so I did my thesis on the Lycopredaceae of California. So I worked on puffballs for seven years. And um, during that time, I became a certified arborist because I started teaching classes on fungal identification for arborists because fungi are plant pathogens. And if you're doing tree risk at people's houses, it's really important to be able to identify not just you know what's going on within the tree, but who is going on within the tree. So you know how to treat maybe the other trees on the property you know, whatever the assessment is. And so doing that as a continuing education unit course through the International Society of Arboriculture, it's a lot of words, <laughs> I became a certified arborist. And because I was an arborist, people started approaching me within the mycology and the Napa Valley Truffle Festival community, learning who I am. And then can you come look at my trees? My trees are sick. Um, and so I have actually been now rehabilitating truffle orchards for about 10 years. <laughs> take a picture. Take as many pictures as you want. You can, you can take a picture of every slide. I don't care. No, just this. Oh. <laughs> I can't remember. Are you local? I am. I live in Napa. Yep. I've, I've lived in Texas and in Washington following my passions with, with fungi, and I'm back in the Bay Area. Yeah. I have a lot of clients in the area, so it's easier for me to drive to go see them. I don't own land. I don't grow truffles on my own property. I'm like a viticulturalist that goes to other people's properties and helps them with their, with their land. So I went to school to be a conservation geneticist and now I'm a farmer. <laughs> so but I still do, I still do the DNA analysis and I still do microscopy for all of my orchards. It is an, an annual thing that we have to do. So I'm going to talk about Cultivation, cultivating truffles, and really I'll be, I'll be talking about orchard management. We're going to be managing trees. And I'm going to go very briefly over some of these fun things. Forest ecology is really cool, but we're really going to hit in this area with the meat of my presentation. What are we doing with the trees? How do we get them inoculated? What are we going to do to the trees? But does anybody here not know what mycorrhizae are? Okay, so I can really just skip over this. Sometimes I have a full house and there are people who don't know what ecto versus endo mycorrhizae are, and they're quite different. And the truffles are um, ecto mycorrhizae. So they don't make heart tignets inside the cells, they attach to the outside of the cells. I love scanning electron microscopy. It's like my favorite type of microscopy because it's like you're looking at things like from another world, but you know, they're right in front of you. So I say I'm just really cool. So little touch on the history of truffles. We've been eating truffles for a really, really long time. They have been thought as aphrodisiacs. They have been thought if you boil them in water and then take that water with a rag and put it over your eyes, it's gonna help with macular degeneration and other eye issues. This is like, Way back, way back in the day, uh, there's desert truffles, truffles, a whole trevesia uh, genre that people really, really enjoy. Um, and then, of course, in the Renaissance, truffles just became like this thing. Huge cultivation efforts actually started in. Did you love this photo? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the tree culture really began in the 1800s with the onset of culinary. I mean, culinary really started to come together with French chefs, rather than, when it, herbs started being incorporated into food, fungi started being incorporated into food. Who got more interesting in the 1800s? 
And then, of course, we have some scientists coming along starting to do monographs on truffles. And in the, the late 19th century, there were big epidemics with vineyards. And also, then we had World War I and World War II. And the, in, the, in the war eras, a lot of men were sent off to war who were truffle orchard owners. And after World War II, those got planted with vineyards. And then also during the Industrial Revolution, a lot of people left the farm and the small rural communities and went off to the big cities. Now, to the United States or France? This is in Europe in general. Okay. When okay, so in the early 1800s, there was a huge, like over like 150,000 acres just in France alone planted for truffles. These wars, yes, these wars happened. It was a successful endeavor. The wars happened. People died, lost knowledge, and then people went off to the big cities, left the rural communities, and a lot of this truffle culture just kind of died. And I'm going to talk about electroculture, which I'll talk about that later. But same with that, like electroculture was very, very popular prior to the chemical revolution and the industrial revolution. Before we started having all these fertilizers to put in the soil, they were using different types of copper and uh, galvanized steel wires in the soils to help with uh, cation exchange capacity and um, you know helping with uh, nutrient availability in the soils. And I've actually recently started diving into that and doing electroculture on the montage orchard that we're going to see today. So with the phylloxera issue and then the silkworm mulberry epidemics, a lot of uh, vines died, trees died, and then uh, the, they got planted with truffles, and then the wars happened, and then a lot of these truffle trees ended up getting turned into vines, vineyards. And now we're kind of going back to more, um, more truffle orchards. I've recently been to Spain, and you can see these are all truffle orchards. Those aren't vineyards. Those are not, those are not um, olives, those are, all um, Corcus elex, those are oak trees. And in the 60s and in the 70s, in France, Italy, Spain, more recently in Australia and in New Zealand and in Tasmania, the government has seen truffle culture as a viable economic agricultural crop. And so they have subsidized, particularly in Spain, subsidized giving farmers land and paying for the trees. Now you get a 100 year lease on this land. Once the trees stop producing truffle, you cannot cut the tree, you cannot replant the tree. You have to let it go to the forest. Because in the 1700s, 1500s, 1700s, 1800s, particularly in Spain, the Spanish government, the aristocracy, cut all the trees down and built ships. So the land is heavily deforested. So in an effort to reforest the area, they were allowing farmers to plant these oaks. Quercus elex is a native truffle, a native tree. So we went out truffle hunting in the wild and we found Tuber Melanosporum. In Spain. In Spain, Tuber brumale, Tuber estivum, and Tuber borkii. All within five minutes of each other, all in native soil. So these truffles that we love to eat are native to this area. So, go ahead. How, how long, when they say the reverse of the forest, like when does the truffle thing stop? Like, is it, how, what's the shelf like? It never stops. So, in Spain, in general, per acre, they get two to three tons per acre. Two to three tons, thousands of pounds per acre. I was told that if it drops, an acre drops below a ton, it's not worth them to go even into there with the dogs. They just stop. And when did that happen? Like 15 it's, hap it's happening now. It happened 15 years ago. It happened nine years ago. It happened eight years ago. It's always happening. I meant like, um, what's the shelf life of an uh, orchard, newly planted orchard in Spain? The Quercus Island. 100 years. And then 150 the years. There's no shelf life. But you said they have their 100 year lease and then- That's a government contract. Oh, so it's still gonna be producing uh, truffles after that period? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. They're just not gonna be doing it. <laughs> or whatever. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just going to go well. They're going to stop. They're going to stop hunting truffles in it because it's not econo- economically viable for them to even go bother. It's an investment. It's an investment. Right. It's like your stock. You're losing money in your stock. You ditch. <laughs> But is there strategy then reforestation so it's a double? Yeah, the trees just get bigger. And they're making so it's great. And it's just becomes the forest. And what did you say they were planting mainly in for trees? What what? Like what trees did you say? Oh quick Quercus ilex. We're gonna get to that. Yeah, oaks. Oak trees, mostly. So there is a huge ecology with truffles. We have roughly 46 species of truffle that grow, tuber species that grow here along the Pacific Northwest. It's 90% of the diets of the rodents. So the, the, the moles, the gophers, the squirrels, all the little field mice, they eat truffle. You can actually find, you can go out here right now in the fir forest, you'll see where they've been scratching and they just, because there's truffles right here. We actually, used to do uh, a dull truffle foray after this class, but um, I thought it'd be fun to go see an actual orchard. So we're doing that today. So basically, they smell it, find it, eat it, poop it out, move it around the, the forest system, whether underground or above ground. And then the spores germinate, they find their root host, and they, with, I will talk about mating content, mating type compatibility here in a minute, but they form a new trouble and then the cycle repeats. So rodents are part of the ecology of the cycle for truffles. It's necessary. We definitely don't want them in the orchard though. <laughs> so uh, uh, Dr. Trappy, if anybody knows Dr. Jim Trappy, he did huge amounts of work on um, forest ecology with, uh, you know, the, the little beasts in the forest. He's written several books about truffle culture. He's like the grandfather of truffle culture here in the U.S. Oh, sorry. Please, please feel free to move around. This is my favorite gopher. Anybody recognize him? <laughs> But particularly gophers, this is what they do to the trees. This is a dead tree. It's not even going to, this is a hazelnut. You can see it's trying to still grow, but the bottom has been completely gnawed to shreds. And so they need to go. And most of my vineyards, vineyards, orchards, they're all organic. I don't spray. I. I Sometimes we'll have to use a glyophosate, sorry, with the weeds because sometimes the weeds really do get just out of control and I can't burn them because of all the fires in California, even if it's a rainy day. I would prefer to use a propane torch and burn them because then that becomes biochar into the soil. It's actually the best way to manage your weeds, the most organic way to manage the weeds. Um, But we don't poison for the gophers, we trap them because we're also concerned about the raptors and the whole like ecology there. So I have a guy that works for me and he is, he's my gopher tracker. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but we do have to kill them because they are very, very destructive. Just this last winter in the orchard, uh, my orchard in Hillsburg, uh, we were up to like 56 gophers. And we tilled and then a day later, we saw the holes starting to pop up again. It just Unless there is ways. They're this far down, they got these massive tunnels. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, you know, we could trench. If you had a smaller orchard that you're installing, you can trench the perimeter where the fence line is, and you can put in gopher wire that goes down uh, like two feet and then also comes up the fence line so they can't, because they will crawl over. So you gotta keep them from crawling over. And then once you have the perimeter kind of contained, then you can work on eradicating them from within and then they, it's hard for them to get up. That's a major, major project. And I've tried to do that on a few orchards and it's some orchards, and we're gonna talk about land considerations. It's virtually impossible to do that because of rocks and other barriers. So then the gophers can still find. How about raptors, have you tried that? Oh, you have owl boxes. 
but they don't necessarily, even if you put up like a for sale sign or free to run for the night sign, it doesn't mean that they come and inhabit your owl boxes. Even you put it in the most perfect place, it's not facing out, it's facing, it's kind of on the edge of the forest. It also depends on the species of owl that you have inhabiting in your area. Yeah, so we try, we try everything, honestly. We put them down here, we put them up there, we put them up there. Yeah, so <laughs> I told me, I, need, I have an owl box. It has not, not found a resident yet. And uh, my friend, she works in Dry Creek at one of the, the vineyards there. She says, it's a paint of light green. The, 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 the regular color is too hot for them. Thought, so, oh my God. so today we're going to talk about orchards and how we need to keep the weeds down, which sometimes can be a real chore. Sometimes we spray, just want to keep them really nice and organized. Because you want to be able to, because we're growing stuff underground. So why do we want to plant trees besides just growing truffles? Planting trees is really important because of all the value you get. It actually will increase your property value, not just having truffles, but just putting trees on your property in general. And they prevent, prevent soil erosion, they increase soil aeration, they give places for birds to nest. I mean, just adding trees to your property, it creates value. And adding truffle trees to your property is a nice, fun project. You don't have to put in 4,000 trees. You can in a few. So here are the main tree species that we work with. So oaks, hazelnuts, and now we're working with stone pines. Yes, this is um, the latest and greatest in truffle culture. So the English oaks, the palm oaks, we're growing mostly the um, Tuber Melaniforum, Tuber Estevum, and Tuber Borkii. So this is a nice white truffle. It's very similar to Magnanum. It has a really nice garlic floral aroma, white truffle. Tuber Estevum is considered a black truffle, but it is still, it stays blonde on the inside. This is the gleba, where the spores develop. And so it has a nice nutty almond aroma flavor. And then tuber melanosporum, you can see here, is a black truffle. It's black on the inside, the gleba, once it's fully mature. And it has more of a, a musky, more deep chocolatey, kind of deep rich flavors and aromas. And um, the oaks, we can grow all three species. And there are other species we grow as well. But here in California, we mostly focus on these three. Hazelnuts, again, can grow all three. And then the stone pine tree, we are specifically, we are growing the Bianchetto, the Tuber Borkii truffle. Yes, and then actually, if you were to root out a baby seedling of the stone pine and grow it, it takes 30 years before you actually get the pine nuts. So you can graft on older tree parts to get the pine nuts earlier on. And so you buy scions from a nursery that are of older tissue and then you graft them on and then you can have pine nuts and um, the bean kato. Okay. So in terms of land, I, this is an older slide. Someone asked me, like, are you going to do new material? Well, this is really not as not changed. Um, you really want well-drained soils. You really want high pH and you really want to be in we're 9B here in Sebastopol, Napa, Sonoma counties. Um, the temperatures can, and the rainfall can really be mitigated with irrigation. This part can be mitigated by adding limestone, gravel, biochar, rice holes, all these things to soften, loosen your soil. What I have learned, I went to college to become a conservation geneticist. So I do a lot of the DNA, the science evaluation of the trees. What I have learned more than anything in the last decade of my life is how to be a farmer. And when you go to get land to plant truffles, make it as flat as possible. Don't make me huff up and down that hill. You know, sometimes if you're mowing and you're on a very steep slope, it can be very dangerous, especially if you're on a tracked tractor and you're ripping, tilling, putting limestone or, or materials back into the soil. It, it, I've gotten in some dicey situations. I don't recommend it. My uncle died that way. See, there, and I have, I know people who have died as well yeah. in tractor accidents, and it's, 
So when you're looking for land to plant trees, you want it to make sure that it's also safe for your uh, tractor purposes. So hazelnut farming basics, which is similar to the oak farming basics, you start with soil analysis. You actually want to get a backhoe and you actually want to dig a six foot hole. You want to find your parent soil. You want to know what all it's in all your horizons. Because no matter what you do to the topsoil, if your parent soil is this deep clay pan that covers the entire land, you're not going to drain, you're going to flood, you're going to rot your roots. It's not a good place to plant truffles. You want good drainage. The topsoil is always going to revert back to what the top so the parent soil is. So you need to know what the pH of that is and how much limestone you're going to add. We're talking tens and tens of tons of limestone. We add a lot of lime, grit, and flour to then raise the pH to eight. And you want to keep the pH at eight. Um, wind protection, you can, you can mitigate that with row orientation and how far apart you space your trees and also with the type of trees you're planting. If you're doing hazelnuts or oaks or a mix of both, and there's certain things you want to do and avoid doing in certain times of the year. You, you do all of your soil management in the springtime, and especially when the trees are young, and then you try to really avoid uh, being in the soil later on in the season and maybe mowing uh, you know, once a month throughout the year or a light till to sort of manage those weeds if you don't want to spray. Yeah. Uh, could we use wood chips for weed? Or is that uh, so that's a good question. So a lot of people say don't use wood chips because they are inoculated with n with native fungal spores. So fungal spores. Yes. Now we're planting non-native trees, non-native truffle species in our native soils that we've now just added 30 tons of lime to. So that limestone is going to raise the pH. It's going to um, kind of dampen the native spores from wanting to germinate. It's not a very good soil condition for them because we're talking about real estate on the roots. You want your truffle to have all the real estate. You don't want to give up any of that real estate to native contaminants. Anything that's growing in your orchard that's not a truffle is a contaminant. And we're going to sh I'm going to show you some of those as well. Yeah. So that's probably you don't do it. I use, you know what? I use rice holes. Yeah, there's a huge uh, ag company out in, um, uh, by UC Davis. They're rice farmers out in the Sacramento Delta. And I buy a mix of burned rice holes and just regular rice holes. So that adds biochar into the soil, which gives a really nice environment for the mycelium and the spores to just have this aerated and moist retentive soil. And, and so I, I avoid that, but definitely mulching is very important. That helps keep the soil temperatures from getting too hot in the summer. As you know, out here, we get really, really hot summers. And um, so mulching is very, very important. If you can somehow steam sterilize your wood chips, if you can get a huge pile, we're talking like two, three dump trucks and put a tarp over them and let them sit and cook in the sun, you could total, totally do a, solar kind of um, cooking outside with, with the tarp. You can even put a clear tarp on there and it will just just destroy anything trying to grow on those wood chips. Ours, like within two weeks, our massive piles get to 120. But that's just bacterial. It's fine. So that's fine? It's fine. Okay. Yeah. It's nice nice for sure. like chicken on site too, you know? Um, Is it? Our, our <laughs> It, it, some, you know, it's going to knock down the population and not all spores are going to take to your roots. So that's going to knock down the population. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're doing pasteurization, I would go ahead and use it. I would not, I would not be afraid to do that. I wouldn't just take down one of these trees, chip it up and throw it out there. I would want to do something to that pile of wood chips first, some kind of pasteurization to then knock back any potential contaminants. Yeah. Some idea of keeping your soil as clean as possible. Do you do anything specific to prep the soil before planting? Maybe I missed it. 
Yeah, we were just talking about that. So talking about building new orchards, talking about finding basic flat-ish land. Um, I now know that when you put in a row of trees, putting them straight is the hardest thing on the planet. When you see a team of worker bees out in a vineyard putting in these perfectly in line rows of grapes, I have so much respect for them. They're like, they're out there with laser beams. And me, I'm out there with this just a cord and some people going like, can you make it one foot to the right? Oh no, one foot to the left. <laughs> that took us all day, anyways. Um, so back to the soil, um, we add limestone and that really helps to knock back um, and we have raising the pH because these, yeah, because the these truffles that we're planting, they their native soils are around eight pH. They're lot, they're from limestone rich soils in general. So if you already have a piece of land like Paso Robles, Santa Barbara has very very rich limestone soil areas, and there's two orchards already um, pulling melanosporum out of the soil. Those are parent soils, they're already like high pH. So it's all about land, land consideration and picking the right, the right piece of property. This is biochar rice hull <laughs> that we use as mulch. I mulch every year. Yeah. And that's a small pile. That's a small pile. <coughs> so when you're working with hazelnuts versus oaks, there are different um, strategies for pruning. And each individual tree, you'll have a different strategy for pruning. You really want to make sure that the interior, unlike this, this needs to be pruned, is very clean because the hazelnuts will grow wicks. When they're growing for hazelnut production, they will prune and manage the tree to be one central leader. And that one central leader of a hazelnut tree will live for about 15 to 20 years, and then they rip and replant. This is for hazelnut production. When we're growing truffles on hazelnuts, we don't care about the hazelnuts because the majority of them are going to be hollow and they don't actually produce the meat because of the mycorrhizal association that we have in the past thought was beneficial. We know it's now a little more parasitic than it is beneficial to the tree. And for whatever purposes it's going on there physiologically, the hazelnuts, typically don't produce the nut meat, you know, the actual nut inside. They're like hollow, they're not really fertile. And they're wind-blown fertilization, they don't need bugs. So it's something to do with the physiology of the plant that it decides not to then throw energy into nut production. But you will get nuts. And you just, when you collect them, you put them in a bucket, and the ones that float, you know, are not the ones you want to eat. So anyways, so here we have uh, rows of uh, oaks and rows of hazelnuts and you can see the differences in how you're going to prune because the oaks become central leaders and they can get very very tall but you can't and even in australia they mechanically prune them so they're all like evenly um, the same height um, it's totally up to you and what you want aesthetically your orchard to look like but you definitely want to make sure that you get certain types of light penetration through the trees onto the soil or not, depending on the species of truffle you're growing. If you're growing tuber borkii, the Bianchetto truffle, they like shade. If you're growing tuber melanosporum, they like dappled sunlight and they like morning sunlight. So that also will give you what row <laughs> orientation you're gonna put into your orchard depending on what, you know, where the sun comes up where, where you are and how your land is, you know, arranged. Oak trees also produce fewer nuts, fewer Not necessarily. Yeah, yeah you, uh, some years you just get bumper crops of them, whether there's truffle on them or not. It's a totally different. So it's just the hazelnuts? It's just the hazelnuts. It's, I, I really don't know. I don't really have a good answer for that. Yeah, it's just how it, it's how it is. You really want to keep your orchard nice and clean. You plant hazelnuts, you're going to be tied to pruning all the time. I use uh, a sawzall. I call it my saws almost anything because it doesn't really saw all. <laughs> and I, I used to prune my hand with, with clippers, but now I just, we just go like this. This is a hazelnut orchard that produces tuber melanosporum in Placerville. We, we chop the top and we open up the bottom and actually 
Um, this year, we actually removed every other tree and transplanted them to another part of the property. Um, and hazelnuts, you can transplant a bunch of times and they'll totally survive. They're very um, regenerative in that manner. And so with tuber melanosporum, they like to feel the sunshine on the soil um, and they don't really like um, to get super hot. So we ended up mulching after we removed every other tree to just help with that soil temperature, um, keeping it regulated. But you definitely wanna keep the leaves out because that can create mold and area for pests like slugs. You don't want slugs in your orchard because they love to eat mycelium. And primordia. Primordia is a baby fungi. Yeah. How old are you transplanting them? Oh, these, these trees are like 10 years old. We transplanted them just to get more sun into the orchard because it was heavily planted like five foot, five by 10. So we just send it out and didn't want to kill them, so we transplanted them. Yeah. Do you have a different gestational years for production for different kinds of trees? Yes. So also different types of truffle. So you're looking at five to ten years with tuber melanosporum, depending on whether you're a hazelnut or an oak. Oaks take longer, but will produce truffle for a longer period of time than the hazelnuts. How many liters would you put out? Does that matter? Is it just keeping the ground warm around or what? Um, you know, how many uh, branches on the hazelnut? Oh, yeah. Good question. So I like 10 to 15 liters. Leader meaning a main stem coming off the base of the tree. And when some get start to get old, you want to prune out the old and then let some of the young whips, the vibrant whips, grow. And then, you know, you get to know your tree. So you just look at them and be like, yeah, I'm sorry, buddy, you got to go. So you take out a center, central, like, big, thick stalk, and you just let the, the ones on the outside grow. And... and as your tree gets wider across the base, the canopy gets wider across the top, and you know the, the drip zone of your tree, where it hits the ground, that's where your active feeder roots are under the soil, and that's where the truffles are gonna develop. So they don't really, and you'll find them up like up underneath right next to the, to the base of the tree, but you'll also find them all the way out into, out into the row spacing. Yeah, so you want to pay attention to where your drip zone is of your tree, whether it's a hazelnut or an oak. Yeah. You mentioned a 5 by 10 plantation density. Is it standard or it depends on your soil? Depends on the soil. It depends on the type of tree. It depends on your wind. It depends on what you're growing in terms of tuber borky. You In Idaho, for example, they plant them uh, like 5 by 12, and the 12 is to get a bigger tractor to come through, and then they prune them almost like a hedge. So that they the branches will cross over and they just it's like becomes one big long row like a hedge but with oaks they have bigger roots they need more space so usually those are going to be like a 12 by 12 spacing so it depends on the type of tree you want to maximize the surface room and avoid too much increase exactly would you transition like from a filbert to an oak like plant acorns or something and have them come up into that to, like, you can they do that in, in europe yeah Yep. So here again, we're having a pruning day. Um, pruning the hazelnuts is a huge endeavor when you have adult trees. This, this is like just gone to the forest, really. This orchard actually has never produced a truffle, despite our massive amounts of effort. It's a 20-year-old orchard, and we have re-inoculated, we have tilled, we have mowed, we have pruned, we have done everything we can and what is what is it it's there with the, this was actually that that orchard actually was this is the second orchard planted in california and the trees were all experimental and this particular hazelnut forest has more different cultivars of hazelnuts than any orchard planted that we know of these uh, all came from Charles of Fever. He was still a student at um, the, with Dr. Traffy at the University of Oregon, and this was an experimental orchard. This is the beginning of his career, and these are adult trees now. And why they haven't produced truffle? Well, we didn't actually test the roots of the trees when they were planted. I wasn't even involved back then. So there could be a, a million reasons. They, they 
didn't have inoculum when they were planted. The soil type is just, it's, it's almost impossible to get it up to eight. It's at like 7.2, 6.8, we just dump tons of lime into it. And then after like 10, 15, 20 years, the, the family's in their 90s, and they're like, how much more money do we want to dump into this? So it's a labor of love if you don't start with exactly what you know and all the knowns and unknowns from the very beginning with getting trees, testing the trees, making sure the soil is correct. It takes three years to manage your soil to get that pH up, the right texture, everything. You can't just buy land and stick the trees in like 10 minutes later. You have to be very patient. This is in uh, Nevada City. Yeah, so here's an orchard in St. Helena. We have gotten a couple of small um, truffles off of this. Uh, Tuber melanosporum, these are all hazelnuts, but you can't till here because there are huge boulders under the ground and because we can't till, we'll probably never get full production on this orchard because it's just too rocky. And the rocks are these big, chunky boulders that, like rocky soil is good if it's fluffy rocky soil, but if it's just big, huge boulders and you can't get in there to manage the soil at all, it's just like becomes, you know, nice looking trees at some point. What's that? This is insane, Lena. Oh, and the is important for or Adding things to the soil, softening the soil. You want nice fluffy soils. Oh, and okay. also with cover crops, working the cover crops back into the soil in the springtime. Uh, also with root pruning, when you do come on to truffle, there are times that you will actually do a light three inch till. It actually does root pruning, keeps your truffles below the soil so they don't breach the surface. If they breach the surface and you often get infected truffles, the so beetles and bugs and slugs will eat them. And then also if you get a frost, you don't want your truffles on the surface. You want them protected down in the earth. So it's just many. Many reasons, yeah. We tend to mow, is there a reason why mowing versus tilling? I mow all the time. Yeah. I, I call my mower a little Pepe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my little um, Super Mario Brothers, the little, you know, it's a little, um, What's the, the green, what's the green guy called? John Deere. John Deere, thank you. I'm like, yeah. I'm little So I am not an irrigation specialist. I am a conservation geneticist. And irrigation is the bane of my existence. Uh, there are so many ways to irrigate your orchard and there is no one right or wrong way. The right way is to get the right amount of water on the trees, period. However you want to set up your irrigation, there are right, there are actually right and wrong ways to do it. You want to make sure that if you're going to put your, um, your irrigation under the ground, you want to put it deep enough that you'll never till it because breaking your irrigation is the bane of my existence. I can't tell you how many times I've showed up and had a team out there and I'm like, you didn't see the lake? We gotta fix that. Um, this is a small version. I have really big versions that actually you install with, with tubing that will irrigate an entire acre at a time. These are my favorite because you only have one thing to deal with rather than little tiny heads everywhere. Great. <laughs> that great, exactly. Um, and some, they do it like old apple orchards, so it becomes like a rain system. As long as you have the volume of water, this is another really good way to do it, because then the pipes are actually deep underground and we don't break them, although sometimes we still do. Um, these little guys, if there's multiple parts and plastic, they tend to get um, sun damage and break. So these little guys are not my favorite. These are rainbird. I really like these because they um, they stick around for a little while longer. But you also need to know what's going on. Here's a broken pipe. Like, oh, gotta fix that. It's a geyser. Um, I really like drip irrigation, especially for the first few years. Um, without drip irrigation, your trees often die, and that's not good. We're gonna see that in Hillsburg today. You also need to know what's going on with your if you're on a well, what kind of sludge you have in the well, you need to make sure that 
you clean the filters. This last year I learned that um, the vineyard team that was helping me manage was never cleaning the filters of our whole entire pump system on the orchard, which is one of the reasons why the trees kept dying and they weren't getting enough water, we weren't getting the volume. And so these types of screens in the pump, you have to take them out and do give them an acid wash to get all the gunk off. And I'm like, this is way over my pay grade. Like, I don't wanna deal with that. So if you can avoid having to do acid washes on pump parts, I would suggest that. And that sludge is acidic itself. Yeah, unless this is your wheelhouse, like find a way to irrigate without having to deal with all these different intricate parts, if possible. It's not my deal. Um, but apparently it is my deal because I, you know, manage this orchard and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna learn about this now too. So like for me, truffle orchard management for the past 10 years has been nonstop learning curve, which I enjoy. And I get to present to you like all the comings and goings and what to do and what not to do, depending on like how you want to put the orchard together. This last year I've learned about electroculture. Electroculture is it's been going on in Europe for hundreds of years. And during the Industrial Revolution and the World War I and II, which I talked about in the very beginning of the presentation, was kind of a lost art. Specifically when we started inventing pesticides, insecticides, and um, fertilizers. This is a way of, this is kind of biodynamic, but in the terms, and Rudolf Steiner didn't believe in bringing metals into the orchard. In fact, he didn't want orchards or farms to have any metal at all involved. But with electroculture, we use copper wires. And this is all about bringing cation exchange capacity into the soil. So I have a few antennas. And then the, here, let me find my slide. There's a name for this. Is that grounded into the soil? Or this is not. This is just a wire loop with the opening facing north. That, um, I'm gonna find my slide, hold on a second. It induces like, uh, magnetism. This is called a Lukowski coil, and this helps just bring this the energy from the atmosphere into the soil, and it helps with cation exchange capacity, and it helps with fertilizing. It also makes the nutrients in the soil more bioavailable to the organisms. What? But they tested it, and it's true? Yes. Yeah, you can see, like, in terms of vegetables, if you're growing squash and tomatoes and cucumbers, this stuff, I've seen it, and there's a few people over in France, and most of their videos are all in French, and I can send you a PDF from one of the guys over in, I think he's in Switzerland, all about uh, electroculture. I'm, to I'm totally into this. So my next endeavor, and uh, this so see how this, see this tree? See how horrible this tree looks? We're gonna talk about montage in a minute. This is a rehabilitation project. So I found like the worst tree in this one row and I added um, this antenna. You can see the wire goes all the way up here and then it's grounded into the soil. And we're just gonna see how that tree does uh, this spring when it comes, you know, cause it's in dorm, it's going into dormancy right now. Like it's, they are dormant right now in the winter time. What is that? So it's the availability of nutrients in the soil. So you have your soil aggregates and the ability of water and air exchange to touch that soil and there is nutrients there, but they can be stuck there and never be actual soluble into the water so that the plants can then suck it up into the roots. So cations and anions are actual like charges in the soil on the different, the You've got copper, you have phosphorus, you have nitrogen, and they can all be stuck on the soil and never be available to your plants if you have really low cation exchange capacity, please, CEC. Please, yeah, it's yes, it's very it's dense. dense no. Very, yes, it's hard to get that out of the soil and into your plants. That's why de clay dense soils typically, they also can rot your roots because you don't, um, the, the water doesn't run off. It's very like soggy soils. Can, it's not good. You need gypsum in there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you use gypsum a lot or in, in there too? Uh, I use limestone. 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 Yeah. Gypsum works too. Oyster shell, um, egg shell, depending on how many eggs you have, you know. There's calcium. If you want calcium rich soils. So here, 
the, the, this is the rain bird system, and this is my favorite way of showering the truffle trees because you can prune. Here's the hazelnut roots whips in the springtime. They're going to get big, and the, this owner wanted them to be central leaders because he just wanted that look in his orchard. So these will get pruned back. And then we also want to keep the canopy from, you know, this whole area open. And then this sprinkling system, it hits the entire um, um, drip zone of underneath the tree. So it's like this whole little under tree rain system and it gets the soil and the roots nice and, and moist. This is my favorite one. Are these drought tolerant than the hazelnuts? The oaks are. <coughs> the, the hazelnuts will survive, but you're growing growing a fungus under the ground. The fungus is not drought tolerant. But you're growing truffles more than you're growing trees. We're going to talk about contaminants right now. I have about 20 more minutes and I have like 50 more slides. Okay, so you will get native truffles on your orchard. Now this orchard here in Nevada City, I said... Um, this is my business partner, Sam, who's my irrigation guy. Um, we have gotten trouble, but not tuber melanosporum. We've gotten tons of tuber californicum, which is a great little tiny white truffle. It has this, this very smooth exoperidium. It has a white endoperidium. When you get a nice pot, this is Mr. Loman, the owner, the owner of the property who, uh, God rest his soul, had passed away this last summer. He's, he's super happy we found something in his orchard. And you can put these in a, a jar with eggs or butter and they will add the aroma to the eggs and butter. You can shave them, you gotta watch your knuckles because they're small, you know, you can shave them and then put them on eggs or pasta or whatever. These are delicious, but you need like 50 to make a meal. <laughs> it's, not, it's not economical viable. So this is, a, this is tuber melanosporum. Next to tuber California, and just to show like a comparison of this is how how much bigger like you know the truffle is we're trying to grow versus these little tiny native truffles. We get um, uh, pizzolithus arises, and my orchard up in Placerville, we collect it when it comes up, and uh, the owner of the property she sells it to one of the local nurseries because then they pulverize it and powder it, and then they make their own fertilizers because these are great for vegetables to put it in the soil, because they're mycorrhizal. So they help, so when you get these in the soil with your other, you know, vegetable crops, the mycorrhizae help with that uh, nutrient availability, and because that's what mycorrhizae do, they pull nutrients out of the soil, shuttle it to the plant, and the plant gets photosynthesis as a, like a, a thank you gift. I really think it's more one way than the other, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get a lot of rhizopogon in the orchard. And in Oregon and in Washington, when we start seeing rhizopogon fruiting, you know there's truffle fruiting in the orchard. It takes about 10 years for these to establish in the orchard. And I have several uh, orchard owners that I consult with. They swear that when they see pogon, they're like, get the dogs, we got truffle. And sure enough, they go out and they find their tuber melanosporum truffle. So when you start seeing pogon show up, it's like a good sign. Even though it's an um, ectomycorrhizal, it's a contaminant in the orchard, and it's taking up real estate on your roots, which you don't want, but it's um, it's considered a good sign. Is it edible? Pogon? No. no. Is it on the surface? Pogon? Yes, it grows on the surface. Oh. Well, sometimes. Is it competitive yeah. enough to make an economic difference? Probably. Probably. Yeah. So more contamination. So this is my wheelhouse, is looking at things under the microscope. This is really where my expertise comes into truffle cultivation, is looking at stuff under the microscope. So there are certain times of the year, particularly September, October, you gather the roots, because that's when they've been through spring, and then in August is when the Truffle primordia start to develop, 
and more of the truffle mycelium really starts to come alive because they're starting to go into fruiting production season. Even when they're not going into fruiting production season, the mycelium really starts to get active as you're coming out of August and going into September. Um, a summer without rain is a winter without truffle. So you need to make sure that no matter how much you water throughout the year, you have water available in August, the hottest month of the year. You need to have probes in the soil telling you what the temperature of the soil is, how much soil moisture is available, and I need to be able to look at it on my phone and be on the beach in Mexico and go, and go oh, water in Yieldsburg, done. Is there that is the best way. That is like best case scenario. Not all my orchards are set up that way. Do you have a, like a, a set number, uh, you know, or is it just, you know, like one of those community meters that you see? No, no, you want, you want, no, no. You need to use a hobo system with a rain burn system with a solar panel so that you have electricity all the time and um, Wi-Fi network. It's got to be very, uh, anyway, so let's go back to this. Uh, so I don't run out of time. So different species of my ecto okay, different species of fungi, not just ecto or endomycorrhizae, etc. Their um, tissue looks different under the microscope. Just like we're learning how to identify mushrooms macroscopically, looking at spore color, um, the texture, the type where the the gills hit the stem, etc. You can identify these fungi under the microscope as well. Looking at, so here is a root. And so we take a tiny little slice of this root using a dissecting microscope. And then we set up a slide under a compound microscope to look at the actual mantle. Because the fungus, as I showed you in the very beginning, that scanning electron microscopy, some of you were here, with the mycelium coating that root, that is called a mantle. And you want to look at that mantle because there are characters. So see how this is very angular, almost like triangular or rectangular? Mm -hmm. This is, so AD is a, is a French term that is angular droit, which means sharply angled. And so this particular uh, quercoriza is a ectomycorrhizal fungi. It doesn't really grow macro fungi that you see. It's just mycelium under the soil, but it's a huge contaminant that can take over all the real estate of your trees. This is a European species. We haven't seen it here in the United States, but in Europe, this is one of the number one things they look for if they have quercoriza on their, on their roots. You can see the cystidia. These are all considered cystidia coming off that mantle, and it's very um, angular on the mantle and then very hairy. This is just a Quercus elex root, and then this is Pisolithus uh, rhizomorph. So you can see these are just root hairs, these are not mycelium, and you can see um, on the microscope how it's kind of flat and has a very thin cell wall. So you can tell the difference between the root hairs and the actual um, cystidia of the mycelium that's on your root. And then you can also tell if you have a rhizomorph or not, because the rhizomorph looks like an actual, like almost like a hair under the microscope. Looks like, you're like, what is that, a worm? No, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a rhizomorph, and uh, pistolithus is, is also a contaminant, as I showed you in the previous slide. And so you can see here you have very thick wall cystidia, and then you also have um, the, uh, the septa. So you can tell by septa, thin, thick walls, and also the, the angles of how the hyphae grows. I'll show you more pictures so you get a better, better image. So scleroderma is another contaminant that, that grows in the orchard. And um, here's a clamp connection. Do you guys understand what a clamp connections are? Anybody not understand a clamp connection? So, clamp, so basidiomycetes have clamp connections. Ascomycetes do not have clamp connections. So truffles are ascomycetes, and if you pull up mycelium on your roots and you see clamp connections, you know it's not a truffle. So that immediately rules out what you're trying to grow. So a clamp connection is two cells where they meet, and they have this little... It's like a little finger projection that goes from one cell to the other, and that is how they exchange nuclei. Because they, because mycelium will shuttle nuclei throughout the the 
my feeling from one cell to another. And then basidiomycetes, they do that with uh, clamp connections. So Ascomycetes do not have clamp connections. What's that? It's like a neuron synapsis, pretty much. It just connects to it. It just connects the cells. And so here, uh, and here's a uh, pisolithus, and here is uh, rhizomorph, uh, a larger, uh, this is under a dissecting microscope, you can see the rhizomorph. So you know, here, uh, scleroderma, you have this long, tangled, thin wall, almost flat, so you can see that, and you're like, oh, what a mess. Okay, so you have no truffle. What power would you use for, to, to see the truffle um, in, in the root? This is it. With dissecting scope and with compound microscope, I'm showing you contaminants. Like 60 power or... As much as you want, depending on your eyesight. Go. You can go all the way into oil if you want, but you can see it under a dissecting scope. And then you want to look even closer. You look under a compound scope, you can go 60 power, 100 power, 20 power, whatever works for your eyesight. But always confirm with DNA analysis. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you what these guys are. Here we have tuber, tuber magnetum. These are all the different truffles that we're trying to grow. Um, this is tuber melanosporum. This is tuber estivum. This is tuber borchii. And I think this is bromelian. This is indicum. Let me double check. Hold on, let me find my slide. Do -do -do. So these are all the different types of truffles that we like to shave on the pizza. Yeah, so we got magnetum, melanosporum, estivum, and then borky. This is actually my favorite truffle to, to grow and to eat because you can grow it on oaks, hazelnuts, pine trees. It is not as finicky. It's like growing Zinfandel or Merlot. You can kind of stick it anywhere. Um, it doesn't care about pH so much, so you can grow this on like... 7.2 pH, doesn't need to be with limestone, limestone, limestone to keep it at eight all the time. And it doesn't go, it's not as expensive as melanosporum. Melanosporum you can sell to up to like $1,500, $2,000 a pound. This is more of like five to $700 a pound, but you can get truffle in three years versus maybe never, depending on your soil. And, um, and you get a very prolific orchard. Uh, an orchard I consult on, which is North Seattle, his third year, and it's also rainier up there, although he's telling me that we're getting all the rain, it's very, his, mm -hmm. he's got a native stand of fir trees that normally produces a lot of lacangium, which is the Oregon black truffle, and he's getting almost no truffle on that orchard this year because there's no rain. He doesn't irrigate it, it just is native fir trees. So anyways, his Borby orchard after the third year, he had over 100 pounds this year, and he's in his sixth year of production. A lot of truffle. Oh, and then this, uh, number five. Yes, yeah, this is vermelli, and then this is macrosporum. Macrosporum is another European truffle with this kind of smooth uh, outer gleba, or outer expropridium, and then this white gleba. He's getting that on fur? The tuber melanos, sorry, no. Maybe white, or white, or something like that. Borky is growing on hazelnut. Lucangium, which is the Oregon black truffle, he's getting on his fir trees, or not getting on his fir trees because of lack of rain this year. So here's tuber melanosporum, the Paragord truffle. This is the apple of everybody's eye. Everybody wants to grow this because it fetches a heavier price. It's got this clout of this, you know, awesome truffle in the industry. Me, personally, it's not my favorite to eat uh, because it's just a little bit more like wet, dirty socks. I prefer more garlic and flowers in my truffle. Um, but you do harvest it right now in the winter time. We use dogs. You can use rakes. We don't recommend it. Just like, just like Chris was talking about using rakes in the forest. People rake, rake, rake. It, it hurts the, the top soil. You gotta put that dust back. Uh, you can also follow flies and look for cracks in the soil. Because where a crack is in the soil, either you're under irrigating or there's a truffle that's, that's you know, pushing the soil away. And then flies also, um, bugs, you can, if you have like, you can find little swarms and they love to find the truffle because there's a lot of aroma there. So, um, they develop best when the soil starts to get cold. Just like chanterelles, just like porcini, they like that cold drop in, in nature. And um, the less rockiness, 
you'll have better shape. Because if you have too much stones in your soil, the truffle actually can grow around the stone and then end up with stones in them. Or if you're ordering online, you don't know your producer, sometimes you get truffle and they have stones shoved in them so they have more weight. Cheaters. I know. So here is tuber melanus worm under the microscope. Here are the cystidia, and they have these very specific 90 degree angles. Very specific 90 degree angles, and just very long, thin walled cystidia. And then here are the spores. They have very, very spinose, like, like little echinoderms, you know, like, um, like porcupines or, or sea urchins. They're very, very spiky uh, spore ornamentation, and their spores are heavily loaded, like bristles, okay? You get tuber indicum, which is the Chinese truffle, also very spiky, but less so. Once you get used to looking at spore ornamentation under the microscope, you get really good at knowing, noticing what heavily spiky is versus not so much. And then also, of course, looking at the mantle and the, um, the cystidia coming off the, off the mantle, off the root hair. Tuber estivum, which is our summer burgundy trouble, um, also uh, harvested, they call it summer trouble because it's harvested in like late August, September in Europe, but here we harvest it here in October, December. And these grow mostly are being grown on, um, on oak trees and a lot of people up in Canada are growing tuber estivum because they're getting it and trees can go through the winter with the full snow and it doesn't bother the truffle at all because its primordial set is in the spring and then the, they are gathering the truffles in the late, um, late summer, early fall, so like September, October. So this is a good truffle for if you're in a much colder environment like Quebec. Again, you can see these uh, spores of tuber estivum, very different than melanosporum. This more looks like um, the octagonal of like a soccer ball. And if you look at these underneath scanning electron microscope, these are actual like, like balls, like ridges that grow up out of the spore. <coughs> Excuse me. Cystidia, very kind of just long and cylindrical and just like, just like my hair, very hairy. <coughs> Excuse me, Borgi, here's our bean kettle truffle. Very, very thin wall, just very straight, cystidia. And look at the mantle. <coughs> Excuse me, my... Laryngeal nervous freaking out. Here you go. Let's go. go. Oh yeah. Oh, I want that. Yay! Thank you. Um. So the mantle of tuber borki is like a puzzle. It looks like little puzzle pieces. Isn't that cool? And then here, you, here is actually cell wall, and then here is the the fungus and how it's penetrating through the cell wall in between, but not in because it's ectomycorrhizal. Get this baby open. Okay, so everyone wants to know about inoculation, and for a really long time, I'm not going to be able to get through this whole presentation, but for a really long time, it's been this like um, secret <laughs> juice, which no, it's not. You basically take a truffle, you DNA analysis it, so you know exactly what it is. Right? You want to know exactly what it is. You put it in a blender and make a frappuccino out of it. And you, first you want to take your nuts, whether they're hazelnuts or oaks, and you want to stratify them. Does anybody know about stratification with seeds? Where you give them a false sense of winter in the refrigerator using vermiculite or perlite. You don't want to let them dry out, but you want to let them get like really cold. And then you bring them out of that cold and they will start to germinate because they feel like they just had a winter. So you take your truffles and you analyze them, make sure they're what they are, and you chop them up and you grind them up and you make a slurry, and then you take your uh, your tree, your baby tree, and you dip it and then you plant it in perlite. 
It's really simple. This is not a secret um, brain surgery. When you go to Europe, almost every tree plantation has their own nursery where they're doing this. And any truffle that isn't a grade A or B, because they are graded for price in the marketplace, if it's a C grade truffle, they either grind it up and make truffle products out of it, or they grind it up and they use it for re-inoculating efforts. So anything that has bugs and stuff in it may go to the trash, but if they can get clean, but not good looking truffle, they use it to re-inoculate the trees with. And they just grow in perlite. It's really simple. This is something you can do at home. Buy truffles and inoculate your own trees. Here's hazelnuts. Here's an ocean of oaks. Here's an ocean, this is Quercus elex. And after a year in the nursery, when they get ready to be sold, there's a whole process we're gonna show you right now how to test your roots. I like hazelnuts. They're really, a really nice tree. They're a really nice tree. So here's the hazelnut. Here's Quercus elex. We sacrifice them. We rip them out. We pull all the substrate out. And after being in the perlite for a year or so, then you give it a little bit more soil substrate, and you and you transplant them into these nursery pots that you then will ship them with. Is there a particular liquid fertilizer or something? Is there anything you no fertilizer on there? No fertilizer. Nothing. No fertilizer. Just fertilizer. No fertilizer. So then you sacrifice the tree, get rid of the, the top. You don't need the top. And then you do a process of a grid under dissecting microscope. You chop the roots up, and then you go through with a clicker, and you just count how many root tips are inoculated. And you want at least 80% inoculation rate on that root. Now, this tree that we analyze may have 80% inoculation. So then you go, okay, good batch. And you plant the other 700 trees in your orchard. You only tested one tree, and you're assuming that that one tree is representation of the rest of the batch. So you may test like, you know, if you have them in a crate, you may go like, okay, that one, that one, that one. You try to do like random sampling, and you sacrifice, you know, like two or five trees, and you're you're spending like 30 to 50 bucks a tree. Or if you buy them in bulk, you can get them down to like 20 bucks a tree. So they're not cheap, but they're not overtly expensive either. So it's okay to sacrifice a few just to double check. And then you also will run DNA analysis on, um, on your roots. So there's me and, and Daniel Winkler. I have to throw this in here because here we are. We're doing um, a DNA uh, citizen science project up in this, for the University of Hawaii with the Puget Sound Mycological Society. And which he's a part of because he, li he lives up there. And at this time I was living up there anyway. So here we are sampling roots and um, extracting DNA. So you want to look at the root tips under a dissecting scope to see the mycorrhizae. And then you pick with tweezers those out and you put them in your tube. And then you shred them. This is actually, I like to, I prefer to use soil extraction kits because I get really good high throughput values and my PCR process and um, it comes with shredded glass, sterile shredded glass that really just rips apart the material so that I can get at the molecules. <clears throat> and, and then of course we, we run gels. And then you get like, yes we have trouble, no, 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 no. I think this is water, water. Here are the ladders and here we've got, that's kind of a no, but I've got like five rows with DNA, which is kind of awesome. That's like a racist. Mm hmm. Right mm hmm. So I'm supposed to go until 10 30. I've got 15 more minutes. I really want to talk about sexual compatibility because this is really where the rubber hits the road here with truffle culture. There have been a lot of research, <laughs> and this is not my process, this is not my slide. These are Ben's, he's from the University of Florida. Uh, he recently gave this presentation to the North American Truffle Growers Association. There is a lot of research coming out. Uh, we know that uh, the mycelium growing in the soil is not self-fertilizing. We know we need mamas and daddies. We need different parental types to be able to come together in the soil. We know this now. 
We know that if you put spores in the soil, a spore will germinate and then it needs another mating, like if it's a male, we need a female. Usually it's the females, don't quote me on the female male thing, it's the other parental mating type that's usually on the root that then finds this hyphae coming out of the spore and then they will cross pollinate and create the dicaryotic tissue that will create a truffle. And that's what you need. And there's also bacteria in the soil. We know that it's now a trifecta. We need the different mating types, and then we also need bacteria and certain strains of bacteria in the soil to make this whole system go to get the truffles to grow. So how are mating types distributed in the soil? And how does it change over time? These are really big questions that a lot of researchers and universities are starting to really hone in on because this is the key to uh, what's going on to get more production. So we want to see how balanced is the parental types in the soil. And there's just study after study coming out right now, which is really, really exciting for us who are in. Does anyone want to take a picture of that? Because this is really good reading material. Yeah. Print this out and put it next to the toilet and spend some time. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I can send it to you also. Can you re an existing orchard? Oh, yeah. We do it every year. We're going to talk about that. So, how are spores distributed in an orchard? Is it, is it even? No, it's not even at all. And actually, after a short period of time, because hyphae only lasts so long in the soil, especially here in California when it gets so hot. And um, I really want to hug you. Can I just hug you really quick? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk after this. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so after a period of time, hyphae dies and hyphae stays, and you end up with kind of like a monoculture of one parental type over a period of time. And this is a problem with a lot of orchards that are not producing truffle because they were told 20 years ago, you never till, you never add more spores to the soil. Once it's in, it's in for good. But we now know that if that is the case, then um, you're only gonna end up with one parenting type in the soil and you're never gonna get truffle. Is so there's been- a whole orchard like that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now we know it with, um, experiments in orchards and in nurseries that after a very short period of time, you end up with one individual on one tree, which is not gonna get you to where you need to go to actually produce truffle. Very important to know. <clears throat> so here's the question. How are truffles being produced? So we, look, we use population genetic tools. And we now know that short-lived mycelium in the soil have different parental types than what's going on with the long-lived mycelium on the root tips. And then that will create the diverse system that will allow the two to come together. So you need to re-inoculate every year to get... And, you know, in Europe, this is native soil, native truffle, native tree native rodents going out into the native forest, eating the native truffle, coming into the orchard, pooping. So you're cross-contaminating with what you want to cross-contaminate with on a regular basis. Here in the United States, we don't have that. We have different native species of truffle. We have different species of fungal contaminants coming into our orchard. So that's why it's even more important for us in the US to re-inoculate with DNA tested truffle each year to keep the mating type compatibility uh, in the soil fresh so that we can um, get the truffle. We, we now know that truffle populations are very dynamic. We don't understand all the intricacies of what's going on in the soil. We know it's complex. So we also know that you don't necessarily want to just plant and pray. You need to irrigate correctly, you need to mow correctly, you need to manage that soil with liming, tilling, cover cropping, um, and then also with re-inoculating. There's a huge effort 
with the North American Truffle Growers Association. They now have this huge truffle research initiative, getting growers to talk to each other. People have been all secretive about what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. And we, with the universities, we are now with the North American Trouble Growers Association. We are sharing information to help each other out. And if everyone's growing truffle, it's not going to raise the price or drop the price of truffle because most orchards that are coming online, for example, the Kendall Jackson Orchard, they don't sell their truffle. They use it within their own culinary program with their wineries. And that's not going to change the truffle price at all. So, um, and, and also right now, doing mating type testing is very expensive, flavor and test intensive, which I do offer, but it's not cheap, it takes a few days to do. So you really have to have the time, the equipment, and the resources to do, to do those testing. It's not easy, not everybody wants to pay because not everybody understands how really important this is to, um, to trouble culture. You know and where where we can buy it? Where can you buy these? Uh, are they online? You sell them? Uh, the the the, uh, the spores? Yes. You buy spores from DNA tested resources. There, I can share those with you. Okay. This place is. Because I know you probably need to reinoculate your trees. I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we like to call them truffle traps. Um, I have some clients who are like, Steph, stop calling them Spanish walls. We're not in Spain. So we call them truffle traps. Um, there's some really cool equipment. That, this is one thing I love about the mycology industry in general. I've worked at many mushroom farms, internship, etc. And you go, each mushroom farm is a little bit different with the equipment, and it's they all have a, a metal fabrication form of one sort or another to make new equipment that is unique to that that farm. It's the same out in the orchards. So when we first started doing truffle wells. We were using robbers and drills and massive amounts of labor intensive to dig these big huge holes and this is perlite, rice hole, water, and then spores. Just mix it, put it in the hole, and inoculate. I also use um, hydrogel. Does anybody know what hydrogel is? I use it in horticulture. It's just this nice powder, you add water, and then also it helps uh, keep the soil hydrated if it were to dry out and gives it just, and with biochar, you add biochar, and then the perlite is kind of like, you know, lava stone, gives lots of aeration, little pockets for water droplets to stay, it keeps it hydrated. So now I prefer to rip a row with a tractor, and then we come behind and we fill it with this same material. We, have, have a, a tractor that goes forward and rips a seam off the row, and then we have another uh, tractor with a you know a bucket loader on the back, and we use a shovel, and and then and then someone comes along with the bucket and inoculates. In Europe, they have these great tractors that does it all in one. If you have a couple hundred thousand dollars to spare, buy me one for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it comes along and it has a thing that rips, and it has a sensor that senses where the tree is. And then it has an injector that injects, and then it has a guy that comes behind and just closes up the hole as they go. And I'm like, gosh, that's amazing. I need one of those. Have you ever used a Yalman's plow? A Yalman's plow. Mm -hmm. It's a permaculture tool for basically like, what mm -hmm. they, like doing that. It's Not like that. Very deep. How I know? Down. So I have a few minutes more. I'm going to talk about where you're not Rehabilitation. This is an orchard that I that came to me in 2015, and the trees were angry, sick, underwatered, and dying. And the oaks were just covered in powdery mildew. And we started, we tilled, and then the next spring we mowed, and we started doing uh, limestone just around the trees because the trees are 15 by 15. And then lots of rice holes. Get that soil nice and fluffy, get the pH up around the soil. We should have brought in like 40 tons of limestone and just did the whole area, but it's not my land. It's what the owner of the land wants to afford to pay for, and it's his budget. So often I go, this is the all you can eat package, and or we could do it the not all you can eat package, but 
If you're going to put a roof on your house, you don't want to just slap a band-aid on it and keep the leak from leaking, or do you want to put a whole new roof on? It's kind of like what your budget is, do what we can with the landowner, what they want to do. So we started uh, re-inoculating, liming, and mulching, and this is uh, 2015. Trees still looking pretty pissed off, but by the following spring, the um, I because I tag I like to tag the trees. I don't necessarily use these same tags anymore because you have to constantly move them or they get pruned off and lost. But in the beginning, I started using these um, these tags, and this tag is now choking this branch. That's how I mean these trees once they started getting proper water, they just started growing like exponentially. It was really awesome to watch. And then um, here's 2016. You can see there's much more foliage, much more green, much bigger. They got several feet taller. And here's in 2018. And then he hired a landscape architect who told him to turn off the irrigation, and they listened to him, and it didn't water at all in June, July, or August one summer, and all the trees just got set back. It was like one step forward, three step back. He said, well... You can either light them all on fire and plant an apple orchard or a vineyard, um, but if you're going to put $20,000 into planting a vineyard, you should put that amount of money into your truffle orchard. Um, and so I don't work with this orchard anymore, but here's proof that I can rehabilitate the orchard. And so now we're on to Montage. Montage is the orchard we're going to go see today. This is also a real rehabilitation project. And this goes to your question is how I got involved with Montage. So they wanted to put in a travel orchard. They were planting or building the resort. And they called me and said, hey, can you come and look at the land? We've got five or six locations we want to put in an orchard. Sure. So I go out there and I look at all the different spots and I go, okay, spot number six and spot number five would be good. It's flatter, better soil types, less clay, et cetera, et cetera. They put the orchard where it's aesthetically pleasing, where you can see it when you're driving in because they want it to be a guest experience. So it's on this really steep slope, which is almost impossible to mow till do anything to the soil. They bought the trees from Charles, which came down in a truckload. They bought five-year-old trees that were larger in pots. Um, the Because it is such a issue with the county with the water and everything that anything that happens at montage someone from the county shows up like no matter what so you have to be very careful so the, the truckload of trees showed up and the ag guy found one beetle and said nope these can't be in california send them back to oregon they sat in a truck for two weeks in the sun in the summer they got sent back to oregon and Charles goes, no, I don't return trees. Send them back to California. They came back to California. They put the trees in the ground. They didn't do anything to the soil prior to putting the trees in the ground. And then the irrigation system didn't work. And they got 60% mortality on the trees. So year two, they call me. All this time, I'm not involved. I just came and saw the property and went, call me if you need me. Two years later, they call me. They're like, can you, can you get the trees to grow? So now you call me. Okay, sure. Here I come. So now I have full control of this orchard. And so this uh, end of February, we're adding 20 tons of lime. And uh, this last year, I've been just trying to control the weeds and get the irrigation. And uh, we swapped out for a new vineyard management company, which has been a godsend because now I have this gopher guy. As you saw the gopher pictures, we've gotten over 56 gophers this winter. It's little buggers. And um, this is a really exciting project. So uh, I think I have more pictures. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Pacific Truffles, Pacific Truffle Growers on YouTube. And I'm in here talking about trees all the time. These trees look like crap. In fact, this one lady on my YouTube channel, she commented, this is the worst, ugliest orchard I've ever seen. You're a horrible arborist. And I'm like, thank you. You know, it's like a bad haircut. Sometimes you just gotta let stuff grow and be ugly for a little while. Like, what is your definition of ugly, right? Yeah, they look like crap, but you can see how dry the soil is. 
this irrigation system was not, like, when it was on, it would just go. And I'd be like, how is this supposed to water? So we, we recently installed, you can see here, drip irrigation. So this is gonna be the first spring of its third year in the ground with drip irrigation. So in addition to these guys, and we've actually, you can see the irrigation hub up here. We've fixed a few items up here. We do not have soil probes in this orchard. I've been just, I can only ask for so much and bug them so much for the budget. But anyways, the trees are getting bigger and um, they look really sad. But they're only really getting glad. <laughs> Here we are. We did a huge project. So 60% mortality on almost two acres of land means you have a lot of open holes with dead trees. So I took one hole. So it's the irrigation is divided up into four uh, zones. So I took one zone and I dug up all the plants that were growing there and I transplanted them into other zones to fill in the spaces. So zone one is now planted with tuber borkii. So we have pine stones that we put in. We have um, Quarkus elix, trees that have gone in, and then also hazelnuts. So we have one whole zone now that's going to be Banketo truffle, and then the other three zones are all uh, tuber milanosporum with on hazelnuts. So you're growing you pinyon Hazel, well, we're, we're growing. It's Italian stone pine, is that what I heard? Italian stone pine, yes. So you're growing pinyon pine, I mean, pinyon pine. Pinyon pine. Yeah, and so you can see the hazelnuts, now that they're getting proper irrigation, are starting to, the widths are coming up, and they're nice and green and fluffy, and I can't wait to see them this um, spring. So harvesting, we're gonna talk about harvesting. I've got two more slides to go. Um, you get to know the land, and you get to know what areas that you get more scent on, and I use flags in the orchard, and I bring the dogs out, I let them sniff and tell me where they're excited and I'll flag because this particular orchard is too young to pull out truffle, but I do have an orchard, two orchards actually up in Placerville that are producing truffle. We just know what trees produce truffle and then the dogs come out and then we just, we just pluck them out of the soil. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> and so um, we don't use pigs, but we do use dogs. And um, if the dogs hit a place, we'll also get down and and smell the soil, which is how I ended up with actinomycetes in my lungs. I'm smelling soils, and that's why I cough, because I do have compromised lungs now from smelling soil all the time. And, you know, typical mycologist, right? We screw our lungs up by sniffing spores and stuff all the time. You say flies up there, you a big little... Yeah, you can find them. They're like, if there's a, a rotten or a ripe truffle in the ground, you can, they'll, they'll tell you. Yeah, we well, yeah. spit in different orchards. So and uh, inoculated, right? <laughs> Something like that. So yeah, here's here's the end of my presentation. Uh, you don't have to use the Lagoto Romagnolo to find truffles. You can use any dog that likes to work for treats. And tuber magnatum. And I just have to thank all of my colleagues that have helped me get to where I am, and of course the Sonoma Mycological Society. And I'm very grateful all of you guys wanted to come and yeah. See my talk.